Hi, I'm Dan Brown, and welcome to my presentation on Great British Birding Experiences. I'm going to base a lot of what I talk about in the next 15 minutes on my book of the same name, um, and I just really want to try and pull out some of my personal favourites from that book, um, and really the, the experiences that properly epitomise British birding for me. Now, the UK might be a relatively small island, but it is a hub of birding activity. It is a centre of some epic migrations and home to many, many breeding species. Add to that an incredible diversity of behaviours, plumages, songs, and of course our birding heritage here in the UK, and you have a perfect combination. Now, despite there being a plethora of birding spectacles, I'm actually going to start with something a little closer to home, and that's garden birds. For many of us, birding began in the garden. They're a constant. They're something that's always around if you feed the birds. You can look out of any window of your house or flat and no doubt see at least one or two birds at any moment in time. We're also often able to emotionally connect with birds as we start to form relationships with them. Them growing in confidence with us and us watching their day-to-day -day lives, looking at the squabbles, looking at birds struggling to find food and also breeding actually finding nests and watching chicks grow. It's quite a remarkable experience to be able to watch these kind of secret lives of birds going on just in your backyard. The UK is a hub of international migration. We sit right in the centre of the East Atlantic Flyway, which means we have birds from all over northern Eurasia and right across the Arctic, from Arctic Canada all the way through to central Siberia. Come autumn, we see millions of water birds moving south from across this region all the way through the UK and down to warmer and richer feeding grounds often further south from here. In spring, we see a massive wave of migrants moving north from more tropical climes and to breed in the UK and even further north as well. Many species, such as swallow, are popular in culture for heralding the arrival of spring. For birders, species like chiffchaff, willow warbler and sand martin often welcome the arrival of those longer, warmer days. This huge wave of migration and the differences in breeding cycles mean that the UK is always in flux with birds moving from one place to another. April in the UK is like Piccadilly Circus in the birding world. We've got swifts arriving from southern Africa, arctic terns that have spent the winter in Antarctica, uh, Manx shearwaters that will have wintered in Argentinian waters, all flighting towards our shores, lesser white throats, from Eastern Africa and Wheatears from the Sahara which stop off on their way to Greenland and at the same time we've got a flood of birds leaving our shores that have spent the winter. Waders and wildfowl all heading north um, and into the Arctic. This continual flux of birds across our nation means that inevitably some get funneled into certain pinch points and these tend to be on the coast, uh, peninsulas like Portland Bill, Spurn and of course islands like Fair Isle and the Isles of Scilly. But there are also a number of what are known as visible migration points and these tend to be small hills or knolls further inland where we can witness the marvel of migration. I would thoroughly recommend that if you have the opportunity this autumn or even next spring to head out and watch migration in action, then you should really do so. Often we get big movements of things like finches, thrushes and pigeons later on in the season, so late October and November, even into December. Heading out in search of bird migration leads me on nicely to our bird observatories, and we have a great history in the UK of establishing and monitoring key migration points through these bird observatories. These locations count and ring resident and migrant birds, and this gives us a better understanding of where birds are tra travelling to, uh, how long they're living for, and what their breeding success is like. Of course, these hotspots also attract rare birds, and that is another fantastic experience if you've never tried it. Going out in search of rare birds, whether looking for something that's already been seen before, or targeting these migration hotspots in search of your own rare birds is a real buzz. Of course, rare birds don't just turn up on islands and on peninsulas. They can turn up literally anywhere in the UK, and there have been numerous examples over the last few years of people taking photos of extreme rarities in their gardens. It's worth checking any bird anywhere, just in case. 
And of course, the status of birds changes over time. Those that were once common are now rare, and those that were rare are now common. The bee eater, for instance, has slowly spread north and has started to occasionally breed in the UK. And the same is true for both little, great and even cattle egret now, which have all colonised the UK in the last two decades. OK, next up is seabirds. With over 30,000 kilometres of coast and 6,000 islands, the UK is home to a remarkable 4 million pairs of seabirds. These are scattered over 10,000 colonies around our coast and consist of a variety of species from guillemots, razorbills, puffins, uh, right through to kittiwakes, fulmers, terns and gulls. Visiting one of these colonies is often an assault on the senses. These seabird cities brim with life and activity. The noise is deafening, the smell pungent, and the sight truly spectacular. These colonies are widely distributed around our coast, and many of them are now reserves, which means that visiting them is actually very straightforward. There are many sites such as Bempton, Southstack, um, and a number in Scotland that are all remarkably easy to get to. If you want more of an adventure, then why don't you head out to somewhere like St Kilda? There are numerous day trips to this incredible island where you can witness thousands and thousands of gannets as well as many other seabirds, not to mention the spectacular coastal scenery. Not all seabirds occur in huge colonies. The endearing Tysty loves crevices and it especially likes man-made holes in and around harbours. Several of our seabirds are also nocturnal. The quite remarkable storm petrel is a tiny species of seabird capable of fitting in the palm of your hand but also living for over 30 years and flying thousands and thousands of miles during its lifetime. You can find large colonies of these endearing little birds in places like northern Scotland, the west coast of Ireland and the islands of Wales. They're renowned for this beautiful musky smell that they have um, and at night, the colonies purr with their sounds, intermingled with little grunts and squeaks that's been described as fairies being sick. Two of our most charismatic seabirds have to be Arctic and Great Skewers. Unfortunately, Arctic Skewer is suffering a fairly major population decline, whereas Great Skewer or Bonksy is actually on the up. But both species are highly territorial and will think, stop at nothing to defend their territory. When we're out birding, we spend a large amount of time looking at plumage details and variability. All our field guides illustrate the differences between male and female, between adult and juvenile. But how much time do you actually spend looking at the details of feather structure and patterning? Ever since I was a kid, I found this particularly fascinating. I would search along tide lines and under plucking posts for discarded feathers. And once you get your eye in, it's actually quite easy to work out where on the body of the bird the feather has come from. So every single track, that's a group of feathers, has a specific shape. So the primary feathers might be particularly long and pointed. The breast and belly feathers might be quite short, curved and relatively soft. So fairly rapidly, you can actually work out where on the bird the feather has come from. And then looking at the size and the colour, you can start to narrow down what, what species it might have originated from. I find this particularly interesting when looking at cryptic species. Take woodcock, for example, an absolutely sublime bird and incredibly difficult to see in the field during daylight hours. Their plumage is made up of all these incredible shades of brown, grey and buff all with different forms of spotting and striping. Rhineck is another classic example, our smallest woodpecker, an incredibly intricate plumage, but when you look at each feather, again remarkably patterned. Of course, not all species use their plumage for camouflage. Many of them use it for display. Take the iridescence of a starling, for instance, or the striking plumage of a golden eye in spring. Summer waders are one of the best examples. This rough looks absolutely immaculate on its lecking grounds. Here in the UK, May and early June is the prime time to see waders in full breeding plumage. This is when they acquire those rich oranges and reds, which are perfect camouflage in their tundra breeding habitats. 
I placed this GoPro camera on the shoreline in Caithness in May to capture the antics of a mixed flock of turnstones, sandling, wing plover and a single little stint. It's incredible to think that some of these waders are probably having their last drink of fresh water before making the huge migration north, maybe stopping off at Iceland, but undoubtedly heading right into the high Arctic, Arctic Canada, Greenland, um, and maybe even further east in Siberia as well. Moving on to something completely different, I want to highlight bird song and bird call. Bird sounds often get ignored, partially because we don't always know what we're listening to, but they're incredibly important. They add an amazing sense of place in our landscape. For me, they're my alarm clock and they're my, my calendar. I can tell what time of year it is just by listening to the species around me. I think many would say that the sound of swifts makes a summer, the sound of chiffchaffs makes a spring, and the sound of red wings certainly makes an autumn. On hearing this skylark, it doesn't take much to transport you to a big open vista and blue skies. We don't need visuals to inspire us when it comes to birds, and far too regularly we place a much greater emphasis on our sight than we do on our hearing. One of our richest habitats is oak woodlands. These fantastic woodlands are home to a plethora of species, including some of our brightest and most exciting summer migrants. Red starts, pied flycatchers and wood warblers all make their home in oak woods and their songs are simply divine. I really encourage you to visit sites like this and to actually sit and enjoy the entire experience. So as I said in the previous experience, close your eyes, soak up the sounds, but also the smells of oak woodlands in spring. Too often they're carpeted in bluebells and this combination of sensors really adds to our memory making experience. I think one of the most important things to remember is that it's your hobby, so you make birding whatever you want it to be. If you just want to bird around the garden, that's fine. If you want to go twitching, it's no problem. If you want to study feathers, brilliant. So I just wanted to account one of my own personal birding highlights in the UK. It happened about a decade ago and I was working in North Wales, undertaking some upland bird surveys. And as I was pushing through the heather, a meadow pipit came out in front of me and I thought, brilliant, there'll be a nest there. And sure enough, as I turned over the bow of the heather, there was a meadow pipit nest. There in the nest was an amazing newly hatched cuckoo chick and surrounding the nest, two eggs and a freshly dead meadow pipit chick that the cuckoo chick had usurped. Two weeks later, I had to revisit the same site uh, and amazingly, I found the same little patch of heather peeling back the bow again and there to my great delight was a much larger cuckoo chick flashing that huge orange gape. So that is one of my own personal highlights. I really hope this presentation has given you a little bit more to think about when out birding in the UK. As well as the obvious spectacles there's so much more to think about with our hobby including sound, feathers and display. All of it's written up in my book so if you're interested head out and find great British birding experiences. Thanks ever so much for listening.